being able to um, uh, to, to to be here uh, virtually. Uh, the paper we uh, present is an extended version of the paper we already given by uh, um, yeah, by not by but uh, given at uh, uh, Kirchberg uh, uh, 2019. Uh, but this is uh, yeah, this is extended and uh, re refurbished version of the paper. Uh, we uh, introduced numerous numerous changes, including the um, uh, the, the 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 core uh, change of of, of uh, thinking about the different operation. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I will start uh, giving this this paper, and my colleague will uh, will continue at some point. Uh, the paper has three goals. First, uh, we note a certain difficulty within the, the early Wittgenstein's conception of the general form of a proposition. Next, we address this problem by presenting a certain alternative to the Tractarian account. And finally, we argue for the philosophical relevance of the whole issue and the pertinence of our solution. Uh, the difficulty in question uh, lies in the incompatibility of the two different intuitions which are the roots of the Tractarian idea of a proposition as a true function of elementar Zetze uh, and are both driven by Wittgenstein's striving for simplicity. Uh, on the one hand, he wants uh, true functions to be generated from atomic propositions in a most natural way. Thus, he applies the generalized Perses arrow to this task, uh, the end operation of joint negations introduced in thesis 5.5 .5, uh, to 5.502 uh, of the Tractatus, of course. Uh, on the other hand, he postulates giving inductive definitions of classes in terms of series of forms in his attempt to rule out uh, non construable elements of logic. Uh, it should be emphasized that a series of forms was originally supposed to be arranged in a string of homogeneous terms consecutively generated from one another by means of a single operation that is uniformly applied at each step. Again, this is a simple and elegant solution to deliver definitions of concepts that Wittgenstein calls formal. This is how the ideas of series of forms and operation are elucidated in uh, uh, this is uh, this is uh, 4.1252 to 4.1273 and 5.2 to 5.2522 and their only explicitly developed exemplification works as follows the production of number series in 602 uh, Wittgenstein is aware that both his intuitions do not perfectly suit each other. The N operation can be applied to generate all the true functions for a given number of elementar Zetze, but the differences of forms between consecutive terms within the series obtained in this way are variable. Therefore, his final answer to the question of the general form of a proposition is a trade-off. He modifies the concept of a series of forms by allowing it to be comprised of non-homogeneous terms that are generated by different complex operations consisting of several instances of the N operation applied to various col uh, collections of previous terms. Gertrude Anscombe, for instance, provides an example of how such a series can be expanded. What we propose here is a different trade-off, a series of forms of true functions that retains both the homogeneous character of its terms and the uniformity of a single operation that generates them from one another. The price we pay is the simplicity of the operation itself. We replace the N operation, which still figures in a system, with a new complex S operation that makes use of a certain aspect of the true functional notation introduced by Wittgenstein. Such a move is driven by our willingness to make the production of consecutive true functions as algorithmic as the production of consecutive natural numbers. We argue that the patchwork-like constructions resulting from Wittgenstein's trade-off distort the supposed crystalline purity of logic in its most crucial point. Apparently, 
following the definition given in thesis six depends on a series of individual decisions on how the formal Reiche is to be unwound. Despite the many obvious points of divergence between Wittgenstein's early and late philosophies, they can be seen as two, the two distinct endeavors driven by the same general idea, namely that of perspicuous presentation, the Bersichtliche Darstellung, where this refers to the thought that the philosopher's task is to criticize language and reveal its actual me mechanisms, something that in turn allows us to look at the world in an appropriate way. When he wrote the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, Wittgenstein assumed that these mechanisms were constituted by a fundamental logical structure usually concealed from language users, users by a surface level reflecting the, complexity, the complex tacit agree agreements that regulate the meaning of everyday talk. He believed that the deep structure of language had partly been brought to light thanks to the logical works of Frege and Russell. Although the formalizations proposed by them constituted a huge step towards the elucidation of the actual mechanisms of language, the author of the Tractatus regarded their achievement achievements as still far from perfect, entangled as they were in flawed and above all superfluous extra logical assumptions. One such assumption prompted Frege to reject the idea of grounding arithmetic in the concept of a Reiche, which he, which he endorsed when writing Begriffsschrift and replace it with the concept of a Begriffsumfang that is in today's vocabulary, a concept of a set, as in Grundlagen and Grundgesetzen. Beginning with his principles of mathematics, Russell also went in this direction. So the move has ultimately become a landmark of logicism. Reducing mathematics to logic is tantamount to grounding it in nature set theory. Wittgenstein's later aversion to treating Mengele-Leyre as a fundamental theory, motivated mostly by his hostility to the need of any foundational theoretic edifice, is well known and has been broadly discussed. The Tractatus also does not allow for any fundamental theory, as according to the early Wittgenstein, the basic logical structure cannot be expressed by any propositions, but instead only shown via an adequate and transparent notation. Yet, even if the Tractatus had endorsed a fundamental theory, it would not have been set theory, but rather the theory of operations. In that Wittgenstein did not share Frege's metaphysical conviction that each number must have its own substantial being. Similarly, he did not share his predecessor's views regarding the existence of abstract objects referred by, uh, to by general concepts. Instead, he believed that the most adequate way of defining numbers and terms like proposition, concept, object, fact, function, etc., was to use the very idea of a Reiche rejected by Frege. Thus, the Tractarian concept of a series of forms emerged. In the Tractatus, general terms like those mentioned above are called formal concepts or pseudo concepts. The latter expression underlines the difference between them and proper concepts such as, such as uh, can be represented by functions like uh, X is red, Y is loud, Z is a horse, etc. Because the Tractatus doesn't uh, dismiss the existence of such abstract entities as redness, loudness, and, 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 and the horse as a, as a species. Mm. For according to Wittgenstein, there can be no function like X is a concept or Y is a number, and respectively, no propositions like the horse is a concept or one is a number. If one acknowledges the existence of such propositions, functions, and properties, one gets oneself into trouble, just as Frege did with his concept horse problem. According to Wittgenstein, in a logically proper notation, a formal concept is expressed by a variable that represents a constant form that all the values of the variable 
i.e. the terms of a particular series of forms, possess. Therefore, formal concepts have no reference. The most perspicuous notation of a variable representing a formal concept will be an expression that serves as a general term for a corresponding series of forms. This is a compound formula that consists uh, of three parts. A symbol that uh, for a beginning of the series, uh, here there is A, uh, a symbol for a certain arbitrarily selected term within the series, uh, here we have X, uh, and a symbol for the term that immediately follows that arbitrarily arbitrary term, uh, we have o, uh, uh, OX. The three parts are placed within square brackets so that the scheme for the entire expression looks as, as you can see um, here in this, um, uh, in this slide. As we can see, the third part is itself a compound symbol consisting of the second part and the symbol of an operation that produces the next term. The operation is crucial to the whole idea because it is recursive application to the first term generates all the other terms of the series. Accordingly, the general term for a series will be determined once the first term and the operation have been given. It is important to stress the difference between functions and operations as defined in the Tractatus. Wittgenstein believed that logicians tend to model up uh, the two categories resulting in some notorious antinomies. For example, Russell's paradox emerges when one attempts to apply a function as if it were an operation. That is to apply it to itself as its own argument. As the Tractatus states in uh, 3.333, the sign for a function already contains the prototype of its argument. Thus, if for a given function f, that prototype is fx, uh, then the result of applying f to fx, namely f fx, will not conform to the prototype contained in f. So when we try to write f f fx, we are actually applying two different functions marked by the same letter f. Uh, an operation, on the other hand, can be applied iteratively as the logical form of the term uh, to which it is applied will be the same as that of its result. In short, the application of a function changes the logical structure of a symbol, whereas the application of an operation leaves no such mark on its result because it is not a constituent of the result. Uh, the other key Tractarian idea devised to achieve the goal of perspicuous presentation, which was perhaps even more important to Wittgenstein, uh, was his concept of a true function. Again, its aim was the dispelling of the metaphysical beliefs that had been form formulated by his predecessors, who had allegedly been deluded by the apparent form of logically analyzed propositions. Uh, Wittgenstein took up the task of correcting them as early as in um, 1913, when he started developing the AB notation that was to reveal the bipolarity of propositions in the notes of logic, uh, notes on logic, uh, and which was clearly intended to undermine the conception of truth and falsity as two separate logical objects. Uh, a later version of that notation is presented in 6.1203 of the Tractatus as the intuitive method. However, the Tractatus puts the stress uh, on the tabular notation described in 4.3 4 uh, to 4.442. Uh, According to the latter, a propositional sign for a logically compound proposition is a true function that maps the set of all permutations of logical values of component atomic propositions called truth possibilities in 4.3 into the set of logical values. As we establish a fixed order of truth possibilities, the notation can be further reduced to a list of signs for the logical values associated with them such that if n is the number of atomic propositions of which the compound proposition is a true function, the notation can be, uh, sorry, the, uh, 
uh, the length of the list, that is the number of truth possibilities, will be equal to two to the power of n. Uh, hence, any arrangement of the connectives for the logical calculus uh, may be expressed by a sequence of truth values signs ascribed to truth possibilities. This makes the connectives dispensable and shatters the illusion of a logical realm populated by ideal entities to which connective signs refer. For instance, the implication if P then Q can take the following form within the reduced notation T, T, F, T, P, Q. We have it on the slide here. I can highlight this. Uh, the notation allows us to formulate a similar representation even for a single atomic proposition. Uh, such a proposition has two po truth possibilities which, uh, with which uh, logical values can be ascribed and shown by the following expression TFP. Yeah? So there, there will be just two, um, uh, two uh, 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 true values or true value signs T and F in the first bracket and just P in the second bracket. Uh, in 5.3 uh, to 5.32, Wittgenstein says that all true functions are the results of truth operations that are successively applied to atomic propositions. These operations are not immediately specified. One can believe that all possible operations of merging truth possibilities and changing values ascribed to them are brought into play. Indeed, 5.254 suggests that one such truth operation is negation. However, the specification comes later in 5.5, which states that each truth function is obtained from elementar zetze by the successive application of a particular truth operation, which is defined within the reduced notation as here, as this. The, the Fs, all Fs, just but one, uh, but the last T, and uh, uh, C and other um, uh, letters for uh, schematic letters for uh, for uh, uh, elementar Z. Uh, this symbol is used in a rather illustrative manner. Uh, the number of signs of truth values in the left bracket is exponentially proportional to the number of terms which figure in the right bracket. So um, it's like that. And the number of uh, of those signs is two uh, to the power of the number of those signs. Yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, the problem is that the the latter is indefinite because the operation can be applied to any number of arguments. Uh, however, the meaning of the operation is quite clear. Its result is the joint negation of all its terms. Uh, physics uh, 5.501 uh, and 5.502 introduced a shorter symbol uh, for the operation, and the symbol is here. The symbol is the well-known um, uh, uh, symbol of the N operation. While C is a propositional variable having a certain determined range, the bar over C indicates the, uh, that the variable stands for a list of all its possible substitutions. The N operation is clearly inspired by Henry Schaeffer's idea of a single logical connective that allows for the definition of all the, other, uh, all the others uh, that had been known to Wittgenstein since April uh, 1913. Uh, being a generalization of Schaeffer's stroke or the Persis arrow, it's uh, um, it's not uh, determined what the, uh, what the Schaeffer stroke means. This is uh, quite uh, strange, but Schaeffer uh, didn't determine which of the two possible uh, connectives are um, his, uh, is his, um, um, his chosen uh, connective. Uh, uh, being a generalization of Schaeffer stroke, read as an operation the key tractarian logical device suffices to generate all the true functions of any given number of atomic propositions. This is both simple and productive. No wonder that Wittgenstein considered it to be the basic logical feature of any possible notation. The only problem with the N operation is how to determine the range of C. 
um, thesis 5.501 gives threefold answer to this question, although uh, thesis 3.317 suggests that other ways are also allowed. The simplest solution is to straightforwardly enumerate the elements of the range, though it is evident that the C variable is dispensable in a scenario in which such an enumeration is possible. The second way is to, gi to, is to give a propositional function as a generator of the range. And this idea is again recalled by Wittgenstein in uh, 5.52 to present the N operational definition of the quantifiers that was exposed as insufficiently expressible by Fogelin. Uh, and the last solution specified in, in 5.501 employs the concept of a series of forms of elementar Z. As we shall see in the next section, it is unlikely that such a series of forms can be given. And here, this, uh, here is the section. Uh, this is uh, 4.1272 names five formal concepts, object, complex, fact, function, and number. However, only the last of them is subsequently properly defined. That is, the um, recipe for the relevant series of forms if it is given. Strictly speaking, the Tractatus offers a definition of an integer by presenting the symbol of its general form, which, <coughs> which is given in 603 as follows, as, as this, 0, uh, C, and C plus 1, where 0 is the initial term of a series and plus 1 is an operation that applied successively generates all the other terms. It is the most intuitive substitution of the basic scheme of a variable sign A, X, O, X, and the interpretation of plus one as the arithmetical successor operation seems natural. However, the expression does not specify the function of zero and plus one. Both signs are defined earlier in 602 where they appear as the exponents of an operation within a slightly more elaborate expression, which is even here and I will not uh, read it. Uh, where um, uh, where the, the, the uh, uh, yeah, the, the, this, the, these um, signs appear as the exponent, uh, which is also the general form of a number. The zero exponent means that the operation is not applied at all, while plus one at the end of an exponent means that the operation is applied one more time. Thus the expression in 603 is derived in a certain way from that in 602. Uh, According to 601, the variable omega stands for the general form of an operation which makes perfect sense as counting is enabled by any iterative process. However, 601 uh, uh, includes a formal definition of the general term, uh, which uh, involves the propositional operation N. Moreover, the general form of an operation is characterized as the most general form of transition from one proposition to another. Thus, it seems that in 601, Wittgenstein assumes that all possible operations, including those producing integers, are built upon propositional ones, more specifically upon the operation N. Uh, the construction of series of such formal concepts as object, function, or atomic proposition is, far, is a far more challenging, if not simply unfeasible task and the Tractatus does not give any suggestions in this regard. In particular, it is hard to imagine how one can provide an operation that produces a series of elementar zetze. As Zundholm notices, there can be no formal law to generate the series of atomic propositions because such a law would presuppose a syntactic order. And since these propositions are logically independent, there can be no such order among them. Similarly, there cannot be any order of simple objects or their names, because if there were such an order, it would have to belong to the logical a priori and thus should be obvious. One can only think of their partial hierarchy of things if things, predicates and relations are considered as different kinds of simple objects. Uh, therefore, Wittgenstein's initial assumption that formal concepts are associated with formal laws 
and in consequence, operations that generate the relevant series of forms appear to be valid only for a limited section of such a concept. The section, uh, 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 the section includes the concept of a number. Does it also include the concept of a true function? The answer given by the tractatus seems positive. However, it may only be accepted with a certain qualification. Uh, the general term of a series of forms of true function, that is the general form of a proposition, is presented by the expression um, P bar, uh, Xi bar, and uh, of Xi bar in thesis six. Again, uh, bars over variables indicate that they represent all their possible substitutions. Hence, as P is the variable that ranges over atomic propositions, the first part of the expression signifies a list of all such propositions, howsoever given. The second part, an arbitrarily selected term from the series, is represented by the variable C, which is also overlined, meaning that the variable stands for a list of all its possible substitutions. The third part reveals that the operation that is supposed to produce successive terms in the series of the uh, uh, is the operation of joint negation N. It is easy to note that if read in accord with 5.2522, the formula in six produces a rather peculiar series. First of all, both uh, the first term and the arbitrarily selected one are certain multitudes. Moreover, the N operation that is supposed to generate the series takes a list of unrestricted length as it, its argument, but yields a single compound proposition. Therefore, it seems that the series fluctuates internally with respect to logical multiplicity, so that the logical form of consecutive terms cannot be homogeneous. Furthermore, when the compound proposition resulting from the application of the operation N to the totality of atomic propositions is subsequently subjected to another application of N, the result is its negation and the following terms are alternatively the compound proposition itself and the sum of negations of all the elementar uh, sorry, the sum of all, uh, or, or the, the sum of the negations of all the elementar is the, the compound proposition, of course. Um, and its negation. So here we have uh, the compound uh, proposition and then we have negation and then we have uh, the compound proposition again because the two negations uh, um, uh, obviate each other. And then we have another, um, another negation because with the two can be, um, uh, uh, can, can be eliminated. So uh, this is uh, how, um, the um, uh, procedure can go if we do not uh, uh, make some changes. Uh, so uh, how to interpret the formula given in six? Uh, one possibility proposed by Zundholm is to read it as a somewhat misleading expression of an inductive definition of a proposition that initially admits all elementar zetze and then iteratively every result of the application of the N operation to any legitimately given class of propositions. This procedure is obviously overproductive since particular true functions appear multiple times in a number of ways. And you can see that here as we, um, uh, as we present, um, uh, present different uh, ways of producing P, uh, different ways of producing uh, um, uh, producing other, I guess it is just, just P, and uh, the uh, the joint negation of uh, neg uh, of uh, P and and Q. It is produced uh, at least here. Uh, okay. In general, although it is well determined and algorithmic, the procedure does not generate any series but an iteratively extending set that is structurally similar to the set uh, to sets of true and false propositions as defined by Saul Kripke in his outline of a theory of, of a theory of truth. Uh, this is how Zundholm decides to pay for Wittgenstein's trade-off. 
Uh, some other scholars have attempted to retain Wittgenstein's intuitions of a series of forms. In, his, in her respected introduction to Wittgenstein's Tractatus, Gertrude Anscombe gives uh, an example of how the series of forms of true functions can be developed. Her example comprises just two atomic propositions. The list PQ makes the first term of the series. There should be 16 other terms for each particular true functions of um, a particular true function of the two arguments. The second term is uh, is uh, n PQ that is uh, the joint negation. While the third is uh, uh, the negation of this uh, um, joint negation that is. Uh, 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 that is the alternative uh, P and Q. Applying N to the latter would again result in uh, joint negation, but Anscombe states, so we apply the operation to the two results obtained so far and obtain N, N, P, Q, N, N, P, Q, uh, which uh, is a contradiction. The result of the next application is a tautology, Anscombe notices that applying n to any of the four terms generated so far will not yield any new term. Thus, she takes the elementary proposition p as the second argument of the n operation and gets n. Um, oh, sorry, I will not uh, present it here because I don't have it on uh, on the presentation. But generally, uh, what is evident here is the lack of a single formal law by which one can go from one term to another. A particular form of transition is always a complex operation made of nested n bricks, but there is no visible order in their production. Anscombe pays for Wittgenstein's trade-off with arbitrary choices uh, she must make as she generates early, uh, uh, each subsequent term. Leo Chong chooses a middle way between Anscombe and Zundholm by claiming that the series of forms of true functions is an example of a partially ordered series, contrary to fully ordered series like that of integer integers. He observes that the first term of the series is not a result of the application of n, while in order to produce all propositions, any single application of n to a subset of the set of all elementary propositions must be counted as a second term. And any further single application of n to a subset of the union of the first term and the set of all second terms must be counted as a third term, and so on. It is not clear if Chong admits all possible subset or subsets or just the subsets that yield unique new true functions. In the case for the former, he simply offers Zundholm's iteratively extending set using the label of a series of forms. Despite foregoing a linear order of terms, in, this, in the case of the latter, he still has the arbitrarily choice, uh, sorry, he still, he still has to arbitrarily choose which subsets should be taken as arguments of the N operation. Uh, and here we have uh, a swap. And I will continue from this point. So uh, the Tractatus does hint at a different solution to the problem. According to thesis 5.101, the truth functions of a given number of elementary propositions can always be set out in a schema. The schema starts from uh, what you can see on the slide is TTTT of PQ, it's for two uh, elementary propositions, and ends with uh, analogical one with all falses, with FFFF of PQ. It's not known whether Wittgenstein was aware that there can be an operation that expresses a formal order of truth functions of a given collection of elementary Zetze. Even if he was, he preferred the simplicity of the N operation over that of a fully ordered and automatically generated series of forms. We would like to propose a different trade-off instead. Let us begin with the first term of the general form of a proposition as presented in uh, thesis six. The fact that P bar represents the least of all atomic propositions, whereas all the subsequent terms are single propositions, means that we cannot speak of their having a constant form. This is a violation of one of the crucial features of a series. See that this is 4.1271. Therefore, uh, 
we should replace not only the operation, but also the base of Wittgenstein's general form. Let us assume that the base is a truth function of all given atomic propositions. Hence, the logical form of each term within the series will be the same. It will always be a single truth function of all given atomic proposition, propositions. Thus, we assume that the proper general form is um, this on the slide. It will be a triple uh, T, Xi, and S of Xi, where T, which substitutes for the tractarian term P bar, is a compound proposition made up of P bar. It can be a conjunction of all given atomic propositions, an application of the N operation to P bar, a tautology, etc. In general, it can be an arbitrarily chosen truth function because, as we shall see later, the operation that produces the series of forms will generate truth functions in a cyclical manner. And the choice of initial truth function is therefore of no matter. However, we must initiate the generation process somewhere. At first, we have only a set of all the atomic propositions at our disposal. Therefore, we need to generate a proposition being a legitimate argument of, of, of our operation from this set. We believe that the use of Wittgenstein's N operation would be the best choice to this end. Assuming P1, P2, and so on until Pn are all atomic propositions, the first term of our series will be their joint negation. So it will be this N of P1, P2, uh, and so on uh, to Pn. Wittgenstein notes that uh, there exist two extremes for a given list of atomic propositions within the pool of all truth functions, that is uh, contradiction and tautology. It will be later shown that by choosing uh, this N of all this elemental Z as the first term, we obtain the series of forms that ends with a contradiction following a tautology. In fact, what reaches its end in our series is, is only the first cycle within an infinite loop. The variable Xi in our new general term denotes an arbitrary element of the series and S of Xi represents the operation that generates each successive term for a given Xi. There is no bar over uh, this variable Xi because each term of the series is a single compound proposition. The S operation that occurs in the last term of our general form of a proposition is the key innovation here. Before we present a definition of it, let us assume that uh, just for the sake of uh, simplicity, that there exists only a finite, uh, num a finite number uh, N of atomic propositions. So we have only N atomic propositions P1 to Pn, as this makes everything much less complicated. We shall define our S operation as a composition of three sub-operations, which we uh, name pi, sigma, and pi, uh, and the inverse of pi, and that is pi to the power of minus one. As we shall see, such a composition allows for the automatic generation of all the truth functions one by one. Following Wittgenstein's notation given in 4.442, we represent a truth function as the last column of its truth table in the form as here on the slide, uh, I1, I2, and so on till I2 to, to the power of N of these N uh, elemental propositions, P1 to Pn. Uh, where each ik is either truth or false, and k ranges from 1 to 2 to the power of n. Within the truth function, the symbols t and f denote truth and falsity ascribed to particular truth possibilities. Notice that in Wittgenstein's view, any particular choice of signs to represent truth and falsity will be arbitrary, as we can see from his own experimenting with the signs A and B in the notes on logic, in the notes on logic. For the sake of simplicity, we shall omit the second part of the sign representing the variables in the following part of uh, this presentation. Thus, instead of writing uh, something like F, T, T, F, T, F of P1, P2, and so on, we will simply write uh, only this first part. So we will only restrict to the the first parenthesis, so to this FT, FT, and so on. 
always tacitly taking for granted a certain arrangement of the variables. So we, for example, know that the first term, this first f, uh, 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 corresponds to a, to a certain combination of uh, this elementar, uh, elementary proposal, um, of these uh, truth uh, possibilities. So let us assume the same canonical arrangement of truth possibilities as follows from uh, thesis 5.101. For example, if n equals three and the atomic propositions are p1, p2, and p3, then the components of the propositional sign, uh, this i1, i2, and so on to i8, will represent the truth values corresponding to the following combinations of truth possibilities. So you can see in the table that the first sign, the, the i1, corresponds to uh, the combination of three true values. i2 will correspond to uh, false for p1 and true for p2 and for p3, and so on. And this ordering is exactly the same as uh, the one in Wittgenstein's Tractatus. For example, on the right hand side of the slide, you have a simple example when we consider the proposition P1 and P2 or P3, uh, then it's true only when P1 is true and P2 and P3 are not both false. So this holds only for um, three uh, truth combinations of P1, P2 and P3, the one with all truths, uh, the one with false in the middle, so true, false, true, and the one with false at the end, so with the combination true, true, and false, uh, which correspond to these i1, uh, i3, and i4 in our table. Hence, the sign for this formula uh, p1 and p2 or p3 is exactly true, false, true, true, false, 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 false. Now, let us define the operations pi and sigma used in our definition of the S operation. The operation pi, uh, and this will be on the next slide, uh, takes as its argument the propositional sign, this i1, i2, and so on, so this uh, sequence of truths and falses, and returns the binary sequence. Uh, this d1, d2, and so on are the uh, digits in the, uh, are zeros or ones in, in this um, two value digit uh, numbering system where uh, dk is zero where the, when the corresponding ik is false and one if the corresponding ik is true. So d7 will be false if i7 is, uh, d7 will be zero if i7 is false and d5 will be one, for example, if i5 will be true. Thus pi merely transforms the sequence of f's and t's, these signs, into and ones. For example, if we take pi of the sequence like true, false, true, true, false, 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 false from the previous example, we uh, get the number in a binary system 10110000. Note that, note that pi is a um, by, bijection, so uh, there exists its inverse, pi to the minus one, and for some given binary sequence of two to the power of n symbols, we will have the, exactly the reverse. So pi to the minus one of this sequence d1, d2, and so on will be uh, will result in the sequence i1, i2, and so on because this is just a simple inverse of this bijection. Meanwhile, the operation sigma, uh, the second operation that we use, takes as its argument a binary sequence and returns its successor. Uh, that is its argument increased by one. Uh, so um, this uh, number in parentheses and with the index uh, two represents this number as a binary representation of a number in a normal uh, normal digital uh, system. For example, zero one zero one represents the binary representation of number five because it's two to the power of zero plus two to the power of two. Uh, the, 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 the ones, sim symbols of one represent the positions of two to the power of a given number. So it's a standard thing in, uh, in uh, arithmetic, in binary arithmetic. If the resulting number has less than two to the power of n digits, the proper number of zeros is added at the beginning so that the number returned always has exactly two to the power n digits. 
So for example, if a result of uh, sigma is, uh, let's say that we have an argument 0, 0, 1, 1. So sigma of 0, 0, 1, 1 will be a successor. So it will be a number in a binary representation, it will be number 1, 0, 0, but it has only three digits. So we put 1, 0 uh, before and we represent it as 0, 1, 0, 0, so that there are always four uh, digits in this, uh, in this, in this string. Since the calculations are modulo 2 to the power of n, we have that the successor of the number consisted of all ones, so sigma of 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on, will be a string that consists of only zero. So it will be a representation of the number zero. So it will be 0, 0, 0, and so on. Uh, and I'm sorry, but the, the, we have the mistake in, uh, in our slide. This should be not 2, but 2 to the power of n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Modulo 2 to the power of n. And now, uh, after defining this pi and sigma, we are ready to define the S operation. So the S operation will be a um, composition of these operations defined before. So it will be uh, pi to the minus one, the inverse of pi, um, composed with sigma, composed with pi. So uh, in a normal notation, it will be pi to the minus one of sigma of pi of xi. So first we apply pi to the xi, then this result is the argument for the sigma, and sigma of this thing is the argument to the pi to the minus one. And this will result in s of xi. Uh, informally, it works in the following way. A given proposition is first transformed by pi into its binary representation, a number. Next, uh, sigma increases this number by one, and finally, inverse of pi transforms the number into, again, into a sign of a proposition with truth and false with these signs in place of zeros and ones. A schematic description of the operation is shown figuratively uh, in this picture, in this figure, which demonstrates how the operation transforms one element of the series of forms, some uh, proposition here, uh, it's a um, P1 and P2 into the next element in the series, uh, a proposition P1 if and only if P2. Uh, because the operation works in the same way for each term of the series of forms, we can read it as uh, the difference between the forms of consecutive terms. These elements are Xi and S of Xi. Uh, the difference is strictly analogous to the difference between any two consecutive terms of the series of forms of natural numbers defined by Wittgenstein in 6.03 as this uh, previously seen series uh, 0, Xi, and Xi plus 1. They differ by 1. They differ by 1. Similarly, each successive truth function is generated by adding 1 to the number whose digits represent the truth values for all of the truth possibilities of a truth function. Let us consider a simple example in order to better understand how all the components of the S operation work. Let us assume that there exist only two atomic propositions, P1 and P2, uh, and the first term of the series, T, uh, is a joint negation of both elementar Z sets. Its logical form is represented by the sequence f, 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 t. Um, as usual, we define uh, s to the power of zero of x as x. So it, it means that we don't apply this operator operation at all. So the series of forms, the series of forms t, c, s of c, um, that is s of t, s, uh, s to the power of zero of t, s of t, s of s of t, s to the power of 3 of t, and so on and so on. This uh, series of forms should generate a sequence of propositions corresponding to all the possible truth functions of p1 and p2. So to generate the second term of the series, we apply the operation to the first term. So we uh, calculate this s of t. We substitute s of this uh, composition of inverse of pi and sigma and pi. T as the argument is this f, 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 t. So first we apply pi to this. 
it becomes a string 0, 0, 0, 1, which represents a number. Sigma increases this number by one in the binary notation. So it's a number two. Uh, one zero is the representation of number two. And this is uh, next um, converted by inverse of pi into the corresponding symbols of false and falsity and true. Uh, so this is the result of S of t. And now this result, uh, this uh, um, f, f, t, f, we put as the argument to another S. So we take S of S of t. We do exactly the same procedure and we obtain the next function, which after all these uh, calculations will become FFTT. Its symbol will uh, be FFTT. Then this FFTT is given as the argument for the S operation again, and so on and so on. So uh, we generate these um, propositions in this manner. Um, and uh, we can apply S to the consecutive terms of the series of forms in just this manner. And the table on the next two slides summarizes this process for the first 15 steps, which together with the first term, which was the contradiction, give us all 16, all possible 16 truth functions. The columns of the table show uh, the following. The element of the series expressed as the power of the S operation corresponding to the initial element, contradiction. Uh, then the propositional sign for a truth function is the second column. The, pop the proposition expressed in standard uh, normal logical notation is the third column. And the customary name of the proposition treated as uh, a calculus functor. So this is uh, the result of, of applying this S operation to the consecutive, uh, consecutive terms. As uh, this uh, sigma operation works modulo n uh, or 2 to the power of n, uh, we have that uh, s to the power of 16 of t is exactly the initial uh, proposition t. So we have a cycle. We have a cycle. The 17th, so from the 17th term on, the propositions generated will be just a repetition of the first 16 terms. The s operation defined as above will generate all possible propositions for a given list of atomic propositions. This comes from the simple fact that uh, sigma generates all possible binary numbers representing truth functions. It can be demonstrated that a similar approach will allow us to define the S operation for the case of an infinite, albeit countable, number of atomic propositions, assuming that each significant proposition only depends on a finite number of atomic propositions. Only then we can apply the same mechanism uh, for the infinite case uh, where we have an infinite number of elementary propositions. Uh, this is simply because there is a countable number of finite sequences whose elements are, form, uh, are from an infinite but countable set. Without this assumption, the method fails as there will be an uncountable number of infinite binary sequences. We should respond to a possible objection that might be raised as regards our construction of the S operation. It could be argued that what we are proposing is just a notational trick, that we are making use of an irrelevant and superficial similarity between logical signs and binary numbers, much as if we were, were as, you, as if we were to seek to draw conclusions from the fact that T has a dash or somebody's surname is also the name of a color. Uh, however, such an objection would have to rely on the assumption that the tractarian shortened notation possesses some structural features mm -hmm. that do not express any actual features of truth functions. The early Wittgenstein, who believed that the logical multiplicity of a proposition was adequately expressed by means of his notation, would disagree. Hence, uh, we would be obliged to admit that it's not just some accidental fact that we may present strings of logical values attributed to truth possibilities as binary numbers, but rather a case of such a possibilities residing in the logical structure of the symbol itself. Meanwhile, we can in fact reassert our own claim by defining the S operator by means of a different notation without invoking binary arithmetic. And this is shown on the next slide. So if we define the Pierce's arrow 
as it's usually done uh, as this joint negation, then uh, we, we will use this notation uh, here. For the sake of simplicity, we shall also use uh, Łukasiewicz's notation, this, this uh, prefix notation where the operator stands before the arguments. Uh, let again n be a number of atomic propositions. Using the notation introduced earlier and slightly modifying the indexing, let the form of the truth function be this uh, thing uh, as Kuba uh, highlighted on the slide. So we just reverse the, 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 the numbers, not from zero to, to the power of n minus one, but from the two to the power of n minus one to zero. The S operation can work as a well-known electronic circuit called the other, which adds two binary numbers. In our case, one of the arguments will be the binary number representing the form of a given truth function. And the second parameter, parameter as we want to add one uh, in each cycle, the second parameter will always be uh, one, will, will always be number one. Thus, the other will always return its first argument increased by one, so we define uh, this S operation as here, where these all things like J0, P0, JK, PK, and so on are defined with the use of Pierce's arrow. So if we put all these things together, uh, we will have a very, very long string, which consists only of Pierce's arrow uh, attributed to these symbols I0, I1 to I to the to, to the power of n minus one. Mm. And uh, we can also present this construction by means of Boolean gate notation as presented in this figure. Of course, since the Pierce's arrow is functionally complete, uh, this logical circuit can be defined using only the NOR gate. So we could redesign this circuit with, the only, with using only one single uh, nor gate, uh, nor which means uh, negation of the or, uh, so it's negated or. Uh, although the complexity of the Boolean definition depends on the number of truth possibilities, we can see that the structure is recursive. The same arrangement of six gates, these two nodes and three ends and one or, is repeated in each position, except for the first that needs only one not gate and the last that does not need the third end gate because it does not calculate a carry, which is used in calculations. It's easy to see that the logical or Boolean definition of the S operation is more complicated than the binary definition presented in the previous uh, section of our presentation. We can say that the latter is a kind of abbreviation of the former and that the relation between the two resembles that between the elaborated and simplified definitions of numbers that appear in Tractatus in 6.02 and 6.03. And now I, Kuba will continue. Yeah, I, I will continue that. I continue that. In the, in the Tractatus uh, Physis 5.473, we read, logic must look after itself. In a certain sense, we cannot make mistakes in logic. These words directly refer to Wittgenstein's dispute with Russell about the latter's theory of types. The author of the Tractatus argues that Russell's theory is an attempt at putting constraints on symbolism that are neither needed nor permissible. Wittgenstein's point is not only that the possible use of a sign within symbolism has nothing to do with the sign's meaning, so the logical syntax must be independent of semantics, but also that the syntactic potential of a sign can only follow from its role in the system. That is, it depends on language itself rather than the decisions made by logicians. Although Wittgenstein aims at a particular theory, the argument he utilizes is general and can be applied in other contexts where attempts are made to subject some part of logical symbolism to arbitrary choices. Indeed, it reappears in Physis 6.124 in order to support the claim that it is not up to us to decide what is a proposition of logic. Wittgenstein argues, we have said that some things are arbitrary in the symbols that we use and that some things are not. 
In logic, it is only the latter that express, but that means that logic is not a field in which we express what we wish with the help of science, but rather one in which the nature of the natural and inevitable science speaks for itself. Thus, to Wittgenstein, it is a paramount importance that any notation we can create has an own arbitrary core. This is closely connected to his strong, though also incorrect, belief in the principal decidability of every question that can be settled by logic, as well as to his claim that when we introduce any logical device into symbolism, all its possible features and applications must be determined at once. The general form of a true function is perhaps the most important device by which the author of the Tractatus attempts to disclose the great mirror and thereby sets the limit to the expression of thoughts in order to show what can be said. Therefore, it is extremely inconvenient that the construction of this particular device does not meet the aforementioned standards. Wittgenstein objects to worldly definitions in Principia Mathematica by his trade, but his trade of solution makes him equally guilty of weakening the logical rigor. To generate any actual series of forms of true functions for a given number of atomic propositions following thesis six, one has to make a series of not so trivial decisions about the exact forms of internal relations between subsequent terms. To paraphrase uh, thesis 5.452, why this sudden appearance of choices? The key advantage of our alternative construction is the automatic nature of the process of generating the series. As soon as we get a certain ordered collection of elementar zz, we can run the algorithm and obtain all possible true functions at once without making any choices. True, each true function can also be generated by means of the successive application of the N operation to atomic propositions within the framework of Zundholm's stipulated inductive scheme. But nothing is wrong with the fact that complex propositions can be generated in several different ways that the dif and that different ways can make different sorts of internal relations between propositional signs explicit. There are no grounds for considering that internal relations expressed by the S operation, for instance, the relationship between the signs uh, FPPPQ and uh, PFFFPQ to be non-existent or of secondary importance just because the N operation does not make them explicit. Furthermore, the very notion, notion of a secondary internal relations between science and uh, is at odds with the spirit of the Tractatus. One should note that the inductive procedure of generating a sequence of consecutive natural numbers similarly does not show that 34 is directly related to 21. But since there is a relatively simple and uniform operation that produces, among others, the latter from the former, the two numeric signs are undoubtedly related by a certain internal relationship in the strict Tractarian sense of the term, that is, a relationship of being consecutive Fibonacci numbers. One may argue that our solution does leave room for making decisions. We have to choose a particular order of a collection of atomic propositions that uh, we treat with the initial N operation. However, the content of a particular elementar zatz is a purely empirical issue and thus possess no difference to the logical form. Since there are no internal relations between the truth values of atomic propositions according to the Tractatus, a particular order of basic blocks that make a truth function is irrelevant to the formal mechanism of generating the series. The text, the exact same pattern of true and false values will emerge for any collection of elementar zz of a given length. To sum up, the alternative general form of a true function we hereby propose fits Wittgenstein's philosophy of logic much better than his own formula given in thesis six, despite the fact that that former postulates a much more complicated notational device.
that is the S operation, and def as defined uh, in previous sections. Uh, and uh, as a concluding remarks, uh, we would like to uh, notice that Zundholm has compared the early Wittgenstein to Giuseppe Peano. Uh, while the latter was a skillful designer of formal languages who nevertheless lacked any insight into the philosophy of logic, the former, uh, as Zundholm says, constitutes, constitutes the finest example of a philosopher whose technical formal capacities do not reach the outstanding level of his logical philosophical thinking. Our examination of the general form of a truth function prompts us to take a slightly more nuanced view. The Tractarian conception was driven by Wittgenstein's pursuit for simplicity, which he perceived as a sign of truth in logic. According to 5.4541, it is a realm of uh, the, it is it is a realm subject to the law simplex sigillum veri. Uh, both the idea of the n operation and the initial idea of a series of forms are simple. The problem lies in an attempt to merge them in the definition of the formal concept of a proposition. Wittgenstein faced the need to either severely weaken the strictness of elegance of his initial concept of a series of forms in order to adjust it to the concept of the N operation, or to trade the latter for some other formal construct construction, much less simple and elegant, in order to have a simple series of forms. The formula in thesis six shows that he has chosen the first option. However, thesis 5.101 suggests that Wittgenstein was aware of the other possibility. What we have been proposing here is the second option, that is a different trade-off. The key feature of our proposal is a new operation that produces a sequence of all possible true functions that can be formed based on a given collection of atomic propositions. Thanks to our construction, the general form of a true function is an appropriate and exe uh, an exemplification of the basic scheme of a series of forms as the tractatus, uh, tractarian definition of uh, numbers are. That is advantage of the S operation though, is its complexity and very narrowly spe specialized character. It is a much more complicated idea than the N operation and consequently a single purpose tool, unlike the latter. Its only reasonable application is the one it was designed for, namely to produce a sequence of compound propositions. What the S operation cannot do is deal with expressions that use quantifiers. Therefore, we do not have, we, do, we have not mentioned such cases. However, since the tractatus only permits us to use variables when all their possible substitutions are known, at least as terms of some series of forms, we can say that for the early Wittgenstein, there is no generalized proposition that can express more than a list of ungeneralized propositions that we would be able to set down anyway. On this picture, the quantifiers are not special vehicles of meaning. They are apparent logical constants that merely let us make certain expressions shorter. In other words, according to the Tractatus, generalized propositions bring no new senses beyond those that can be expressed in ungeneralized truth functions. Furthermore, we do not remove Wittgenstein's N operation from the Tractarian conception of logic. On the contrary, it plays a role in our construction. Each particular truth function can also be obtained in the course of iterative application of N to elementar Zetze. What the N operation definitely cannot do is provide a constant difference of forms for the series of true functions. The S operation, however, can. It yields all the possible terms of the series algorithmically at once and independently of any logician's choice. Thank you very much. <laughs>